In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top-ranked fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer, we answer fitness and health questions that are asked by listeners and viewers just like you. But the way we open the episode was with an introductory portion where we talk about current events, our favorite shows on TV. We talk about scientific studies. Today's episode, that, that intro portion was 44 minutes long. After that, we answered the fitness questions. By the way, you can go to mindpumppodcast.com and just skip to your favorite part. Everything is time stamped. All right, let me give you a breakdown of today's episode. We open up by talking about a show on Netflix called Stay Here. Sounds really good. Adam and Justin are super into it. Uh, then we talk we about snoring, snoring at night. Thanks, honey, for waking me up four times because I snored last night. Mm. Then we talked about a new university online for fans only people. So if you're trying to build a fans only page, <laughs> you can actually learn how to do it uh, with the university. Make so, some money making poses. Which, of course, led us to talking about the sex talk we're going to have with our kids soon. Justin's mm. son is right around that age and my daughter's right around that age. So the awkward conversation we'll see how this goes. is coming. Then I talked about how some of my friends on Facebook are posting things that make me a little concerned. It's this whole yeah. concept that people who disagree with you are not just wrong, yeah. but they're actually evil. Uh, this is a terrible, terrible uh, way of thinking. So we had a conversation around that. And that led us to talk about a recent podcast that we saw on YouTube with our friend Tom Bilyeu. The podcast is called Impact Theory. Uh, with Tom Bilyeu. He's got some of the greatest guests we've seen anywhere. Very inspirational, very motivational. The podcast we're talking about was with Vusi Thembequayo. Uh, great, great uh, podcast. You can find it on Tom Bilyeu on YouTube. Um, then Adam brought up blue light blocking glasses and the impact they have on his sleep. So we talked about our sponsor, Felix Gray, that makes blue light blocking glasses that look good and don't change the color of everything. Consistency is key. By the way, they are in partnership with Breast Cancer Research Foundation, uh, meaning that every time you buy something uh, from them, they actually will give some money to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Uh, I believe the one product they have that will give that donation is the Roebling in Rose Quartz. That's the style of glasses. Anyway, if you go to Felix Gra uh, FelixGrayGlasses.com, that's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y Glasses.com forward slash Mind Pump, uh, you can check out all of their products. Then we talked about another one of our partners, Public Goods. They make a lot of household products, or at least they sell a lot of household products and products for your pets um, at incredibly low prices. They're eco-friendly, and they have products that are healthy, so they are not uh, contain lots of chemicals that are harsh on your skin or your body. Um, by the way, if you go to publicgoods.com forward slash mind pump, so that's publicgoods.com forward slash mind pump, or just use the code mind pump, you get a crazy hookup. Uh, go check out what the hookup is. It's actually hard to believe. Then I talk about fake martial arts. There's a page on Instagram I really love called McDojo something. McDojo, I don't remember. Oh, I don't know, but McDojo I Life, it. that's what it is. Go yeah. check it out. And then Justin talked about Legos. Yeah. Then we got into answering the, the fitness questions. Here's the first one. Is there such a thing as too deep of a squat? Um, so we talk about squats and mobility. By the way, if you go to mapsprimewebinar.com, you can learn some free mobility moves that'll help you with your squats. The next question, this person wants some tips on the one of the best exercises for the upper body called dips. The third question, this person says, look, you've talked before about how building muscle speeds up the metabolism, but recently I've seen some articles that say that's a bit of a myth, like what's the deal? So we try to clarify a little bit in that part of the episode. And then the final question, this person says, look, I've heard that calories in versus calories out is what's important for fat loss or fat gain. Then I've heard other people say, just eat healthy and then it doesn't matter how much you eat, you'll get leaner. What's the deal? So we break it down uh, so you know what the truth is and not what the myth is. Uh, also, this month, two of our most popular workout programs, MAPS Anabolic, a full body muscle building strength building and metabolism boosting program. So if you're somebody that wants to boost your metabolism uh, so you can eat more calories and be leaner, MAPS Anabolic is a phenomenal program for you. It retails at $117. So that program and our No BS six-pack formula, which is a core training program designed to bring out definition in your abs, in your obliques by building them so you can see them even at higher body fat percentage, that program retails at something like 50 something dollars. So both programs normally 174 bucks. Right now, get both of them 
for $59.95, one payment, lifetime access. They come with exercise demos, workout blueprints, you know, how many sets, how many reps you need to do, everything. Remember, MAPS Anabolic is a three-month program, so it's a 90-day program. Both of them, right now, together, $59.95. Go to mapsoctober.com to sign up. Again, that's mapsoctober.com. And it's t-shirt time. Oh, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Oh, yes, it is. We have two winners, one for Apple Podcasts, one for Facebook. The Apple Podcast winner is Indy Rowe. And for Facebook, we have Susan Smith. Both of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Yeah. Am I? Is, did everybody get bad sleep last night, or is it just me? I feel like everybody. Yeah, I got bad sleep. You asleep. did too, huh? Yeah. Everybody. I don't know. You did too. I, I was. Mine was yeah, bad off, too. Yeah, dude. That's why this is like my fourth cup. You know, like uh, <laughs> wow, so, whoa, dude. Wow. I mean, not nitro, but it's definitely number three for nitro. So. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's, what that's, was the? That's uh, what was the heavy. Fir- it's a heavy hand this morning. What yeah. was the first one? Just at home. The yeah, brew? at home. The brew. Yeah, the drive the, over it here doesn't right? count, dude. Yeah. So do you? Okay, do you have a cup at home and then for the? Because you have a long drive here. Do you drink on the way? Yeah, I drink on the way. Yeah, yeah it's, it's okay. in the thermos. So okay. yeah, I yeah, I'm a professional. Oh I, I, I don't suggest this to your average. Uh, that's weird. Common that's person. weird. All of us got bad sleep last night. All of us, dude. Oh, wow. maybe we were all dreaming together. Well, yeah. maybe no, that's not my excuse. Ew. We were all visiting. Uh, I mean, you guys in, were in my dream. In dr- were we? No. Oh, I got I got hooked on that stupid show that Justin had mentioned on right. The, I've Which been, one? I'm on. The, I don't know how far you are, but I've gone through like. I don't know, eight, I, eight no, of those things. I was going to keep going. I've only gotten through four of them. So Wait, I, I'm called, excited to okay, see so what else. You know what? Do you remember, okay, five years ago when we first started this podcast, right, when nobody was really listening? I remember those days. Yeah, so I have to, I have to point out these things. <laughs> I was I talked a lot about uh, Airbnb and VRBO. Yeah. Like I, I just have always been very fascinated with the the business model, and that show is so great for because they break and I love stuff like this that they break the numbers down. Yeah, like so they'll go in an exactly. area. For example, I was looking at Paso Robles. I know you're heading down that direction yeah, I'm going down pre- there. pretty soon, and uh, they're you know they're finding a property there, and they have like they have the data for last year. Paso Robles made you know. Uh, two hundred million dollars total. It's mm-hmm. not that number, but I'm just for you know argument's sake, right? So we, they they made twenty million dollars in the last year in VRBO rentals, and there's a total of and they one, show who's killing it. Yeah, and they why. show a hundred one hundred seventy two properties there that are that are in that are. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa Doug! Hell, yeah, are you watching your, just summon a demon? Are you is. watching your porn right now? <laughs> stop, stop, <laughs> Jesus guy! Come on, can't even wait till we're done with the podcast. <laughs> oh my god! I, I told you the desk is too high. Yeah, you can't man. see what's happening Jesus. down there. <laughs> so no, so anyways, it it uh, so then it breaks down. There's a uh, hundred something properties. Uh, the average, I mean everything, and then they go in. It's this. This famous designer, mm-hmm. and he—I forget what he's famous for, but like he's like the business, he's the, the business marketing, guy. business and marketing, marketing, and then she's a designer. They go into these places, they find somebody, and then they flip the property, and mm-hmm. just by designing okay, it, create a whole new experience with it. I think it's it's interesting because we. Uh, I mean, ourselves as this company, we have stayed in a bunch of, uh, you know, Airbnbs, RB, yes. RVBOs, VRBOs. I don't Our, know. I always like <laughs> a, flip that. A, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I always do that. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, you know uh, the difference between uh, the, the quality of like, this one feels like a hotel. Like they really were thoughtful in, yeah. in the way that they displayed things. Like, uh, you know, they were really considerate at, you know, for the person that's staying there as opposed to the person that like owns it. What's, well, the, this, na- what's the name of the show? What? It's called Stay Here. Okay. Stay here. So what was, fasc- what was fascinating about it was that was just it. So, you know, I've been bef- even before this business, um, you know, Katrina and I have been using, since we've been dating for over 10 years now, right? So we've been using air Airbnb, VRBO for a very long time. And I've watched the evolution of it. When it first started, it was 100% people's second or third homes. Yeah. And they just, hey, I'm not using it in the summertime. May as well rent it out, make There's a little still side pictures cash. Pictures of them yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Their clothes are in the closet. That is the norm. And it's still, it still has a little bit of that left. 
but I've watched it transition from that to purely a business. Because it's competitive. Yeah, mm-hmm. now it's competitive with hotels. Yeah, well, yeah. not just that. They have to compete with each other, right? So right. this our, our Air, Airbnb... What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> the RBO, <laughs> see, I screwed you up. Airbnb, you yeah. did. Yeah. Um, you, you, know, you got two houses to pick from. You want to go in the one that's got a cleaner feel, Dude. more professional, that provides How you... How about that the- Austin place? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I they was do. Like, wow. It, they did an awesome job of that. It's amazing. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, they're professionals at what they do, right? So, it's so like, what do they do? They go in and they I set mean, they, these houses up. They literally for- do this. Like, so they go in and and they gut the house. Like, so like they'll take a like he, he's referring to the Austin one. The Austin house was like this little two three bedroom cottage in Austin, Texas, which is a hot area for people to be traveling to and staying in Airbnbs. It has a pool in the backyard, a little pool house. And it was very basic, and it was nice. The guy, it was it was pretty nice. But yeah, it was it's nice. Just the way they they laid the house out by giving it more kitchen space, and then changing the coloring they of the brought walls, in a barbecue, so the, smoker. So the yeah, idea is they, to yeah the the back uh, that that pool house. They actually did like a mural, so it really felt like Austin because they're in, instead of it it feeling like a home, they made it feel like an experience. So the the okay, so the show they go in, they get a house, and then the the idea is to remake it and make it uh, profitable so on they, Airbnb. They, they yeah. even they even do this so that exactly. before they go in, okay, which I, I what I love about the show is they they share all the numbers, right? So that they'll find right. somebody like the Austin guy, and I'm again I'm just going to throw out numbers so the audience understands how the show works. Uh, he has a 25 percent occupancy rate. Which equals that means you know twenty uh, percent of uh, thirty days in a month is about what eight or so or, or no I see. math right whatever however many days eight or twelve days a month so they show before this is how much you were making how much he's making yeah. after this is how yes much. right oh I see and then they go in and the the thing that I really enjoy watching it uh, is their thought on like it's not just like of course making the house nicer is one thing. But it's like why people going there and then gearing the whole house around that experience. Because Mm, most people that are coming into Austin, they want to know where the best barbecue places are and where the best places to go downtown for a drink is and, Mm -hmm. you know, the things you can do on the water and all this stuff. Like They want the memories. So you watched this show like super late? Is that why you didn't get good sleep? Oh, yeah. Or it was on your mind? So Uh, it was on. Okay. So (laughs) dreaming of remaking houses. No, no, no. (laughs) But it is. So uh, last night, Katrina goes to to bed. Uh, I know. I've told Totally, like that's how I am. So, Katrina goes to bed early. I thought she was sleeping, and I stay down and I get. She, I, I like these shows. She's less into the shows like this, so this is my opportunity to like to binge watch because she went to bed early at like eight thirty. So I'm like I'm watch like three, four, or five of these things in a row, and so my mind's like swirling. And the reason why it's going a lot right now is, and we talk off air. We don't share this on the air very often, but you know, we all live in California. We all. Um, Justin owns his house, but the other three of us, we rent, Mm -hmm. you know, and we talk all the time about like, I don't know if I'm ever going to buy a house in California. Mm -hmm. And, and I wrestle with this every day. Like, should we buy here or should we do investment properties? And like, and so that's something that we talk, uh, Katrina and I go back and forth and she's very, she's like, she trusts me. Like, you know, whatever you think is best for the family, like I'm game for whatever, whatever you want to do. And and I am. I'm just. I'm really uh, hesitant to go out and go buy this. You know, because even a you know a little bit above average house in the Bay Area is you know million, multiple million dollars. Yeah, people don't understand yeah, if you don't live around here. You don't know how crazy it's. It's insane. It's yeah, literally and, insane. And so do the math on that a little bit, okay? So that you're talking about twenty percent down on that. You're looking at four to five hundred thousand dollars. Four to five hundred thousand dollars in Austin, Paso Robles, all these areas that I'm watching this. I mean, you could take. You know, eighty to hundred grand down on these things uh, with twenty twenty five percent down on these properties. Flip them into you know vacation homes, and it become cash flow. No, and this you, is a good topic right. because it's 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 having your money make money for you. This is what smart investors understand. And one of the challenges that because I run into the same exact thing you do, Adam. And here's the challenge. The challenge is I was raised with this narrative. Yes, remember my parents. Or that owning your home is like the American dream. You or have buy, to own buying a home, I should say. Yes, Not you owning have, a home. Buying a home is the American yes, dream. Yes, you have to buy a house. That's very important. It's, you know, my parents remember they're poor immigrants, so they come to this country. When they came to San Jose, it was very different in the Bay Area. It was very you know, much less expensive. We still had Silicon Valley back then, but it was in its infancy. So the price I mean, my parents paid a hundred and thirty thousand dollars, something like that, for their house, which now is probably one point four million. Uh, which and by the way, it's a, it's a very average home. So people think, oh, 1.4 million. It's a man. No, it's a it's a very average home. 
Um, but the, the the narrative is you buy a house and then you eventually pay it off. You don't have to pay a mortgage anymore, and that's very important. But it doesn't make sense when the cost when you could take that same money. Because like you said, Adam, you buy a house here, an average home, you're putting anywhere between two to three hundred thousand or more dollars down. You've tied up a lot of your your assets are tied up into one investment mm-hmm. and you're not making money off of it because you live there. It's very different. Well, not to not to mention that. There's also other things, right? So and this is where California is different than the other parts of the country. So it depends on who's listening to this and where you're at. Uh, there's a, what's called like a 20x rule that I think is a really good rule to look at when you're thinking about p- potentially purchasing a house that you might live in. And that is that it you the rent should not be twenty if it's more than like so you calculate for a year like what, how much can you get for rent for, for this rent house? Yeah, yeah I'm buying this house but what if I were to rent it how much could I get for a year and if it is under t- uh, the twenty x the twenty x rule then the house is grossly inflated right so, so in other words if you could rent your house but it doesn't even come close to covering your mortgage. Uh, you're basically banking on the fact that the house yeah, is it's appre- a bad investment. That's going to appreciate in value, which, right. you know, okay, that's kind of a risky bet. And not only that, but you live in the house. And when you live in the house, it's not an investment. I mean, that's something you live in. If, if your investment goes bad, mm-hmm. you're out of a house versus if you invest somewhere else, then you can play a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, well, that, that, you know, uh, my CPA really helped me look at this different. Like, I, I, I too, like you, Sal, like I grew up, um, that was like the greatest accomplishment was buying my house. Yep. Like, to this day, I still remember that moment for me was like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I made it in life. But I just, at that time, I didn't really understand the, the importance of having money working for me mm-hmm. versus being caught up in this, oh, I've, I've proved it, I've made it, I bought my own house. Mm-hmm. Because of how much it could tie up. I mean, you you take a house like that, okay, and this is like that you tie up to put a down payment on a place that's over a million dollars, you're talking about a quarter million to half a million dollars that you have to tie up. It's stuck in that one that, yeah. investment or whatever. And then in, in addition to that, if you decide in three to five years that you've either outgrown the house or you want to relocate and move, you're forced to sell because the house can't rent for even close to what the mortgage is because you would be losing a thousand, two thousand plus dollars versus, a month. Versus renting that house, that same house. So now, yeah, you are renting, but you have you still have the lump of your uh, your your money in the bank. You could take that same three hundred thousand dollars and potentially buy three properties with down payments in the U.S. and much better markets that are all going to make you more in rent than your mortgage. This is how this is how you create wealth. I think a lot of people, you know, there's there's a there's there's really a it's a, it's a pretty black and white way to create wealth when you talk to people who've actually built it themselves. And it's like step one is get rid of debt, save money, and then step the next step is make your money make money for you. Because if you count on becoming wealthy off of your income with your job. Good luck. That's yeah. gonna be a very difficult way to do it. Most it's people so, never. It's so hard to get. I was. I had this. So my niece just bought a really cute little place over <clears throat> in the Aptos area. Down almost a fucking million dollars. And I mean, it has no garage. It's like 900, 1100 square feet. I guess. Oh, gosh. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's old as fuck, right? But it's it's cute, and it's in a great location. She's like less than five minutes from the beach. Like it's mm-hmm. like right there off the freeway, and. You know, I was trying to explain, but, it, you know, she's at that place in her life where she can. She can buy it. She's saved up really good. She's got a great job. She can afford to live there. And I, and you just, it's so hard to get, and I'm sure I would have been the same way at the same point in my life of like, no, this is like, Dude, we are taught that yes. that buying your house is like one of the greatest accomplishments that you can ever it make. It depends where you buy because it could also be a terrible investment. Obviously, I think 2008 taught a lot of people that. And it's, yeah. you know you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me How of- what you get for your, your house too. It, yes. It's factored. And in. it reminds me of the narrative that you have to get a four-year degree. You have to go to college in order to become successful as a result result, you have people going to college for degrees that don't pay off and they're stuck with $100,000 worth of debt. It's not a good investment. But because that narrative is hammered into your head, no, this is the way to do it. It's the only way to do it. They end up screwing themselves in the future. That's why you have to kind of look at the narrative and be like, does this still apply? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think uh, I don't know. I think some people still. I mean, to to be like devil's advocate on some level, like to not answer to anybody is definitely something that's appealing sure. in terms of not you know having to then uh, you know all your if you're renting out all of your places uh, and you're yourself renting now you're under somebody else's uh, you, you know rules and regulations and all those types of things, yeah. which is something you have to like relieve. But if you're thinking long term, again, this is short term thinking versus long term thinking. Yeah, but you know what's funny about that? Because I know I'm like that too. I, think. I just don't like I, any, answering anybody. Me too. I hate it. I hate it. I don't like you know working for anybody. I'm, <laughs> so I'm an entrepreneur. I don't like telling right. people. To, but here, but that's a little bit of a false narrative too because you pay property taxes. Oh, so you're answering. You pay, yeah, you you pay off your house <laughs> all you daddy want. Daddy government. <laughs> you yeah. got to pay something. Yeah. You know, especially and, here. Yeah. And again, it depends where you're where you're living too. If you yeah. can afford a house outright, and you know it's something that you can easily pay yeah. off. You know, that might be yeah. something that then you can, you know, venture out and get more into investment. Well, but again, it's to each their own. Yeah, so well, as, speak- you can, as you can imagine, this conversation is what kept me up last <laughs> so night. So you were up right? all night. Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah. So I come into bed thinking that she's asleep and she's not. She's still awake. And then she's like, what are you doing? And then I tell her, oh, I'm watching this. And she and then she's, uh, I tell her like, you know, I, I really like this idea of like maybe messing around in the Airbnb, VRBO market or like that. Mm-hmm. And she's like, "Oh, that's what we're doing now." Because <laughs> like, I, I like, <laughs> so now we've moved over here. Yeah, yeah. Because literally, <laughs> she's gotten on to me a few times. She's like, "Hun, literally, you just said this is what Bro, we're going to do." And Jessica I'm like, I change says, my mind every day. Jessica says the same thing to me. She yeah. goes, "You get me excited about this thing. Yeah, then yeah. you change your mind. <laughs> yeah. Now you say we got to save. Then you say we got to invest." And yeah, I, yeah. I start telling myself, "Like, I'm not going to say." We anything. just think out loud. That's it, our problem. That yeah. is. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I didn't sleep is totally different. So the reason why I didn't sleep is because my wife told me several times last night that I was snoring. Oh, so that she woke me up. <laughs> She, she, she jab you a few times. Yeah, she, no, no, she does this thing. You're snoring real loud. You know, I'm like, oh, oh shit. Yeah, I, I turned I, over. So like, I, well, now we're both not sleeping. Thank I brought that. We yeah. were just talking about this. Katrina and I literally were talking about this last week about uh, snoring because uh, I don't know if you brought this up or someone brought it up. It started the conversation, and I was asking her. I'm like, you know, I know there's been nights where I'm if I'm really exhausted, uh, really bad allergies, or I'm sick. I know for sure that I snore. Other than that, I don't really snore. So I've asked her like. You know, you don't really say much to me. Like, do I have I snored a lot and you just don't tell me? She's like, no, absolutely not. She goes, you hardly ever. If you and then she goes, if you're sick or you had a really long day, she goes, so maybe you know, one out of ten times, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you have a night. And she goes, and I, uh, I always wake you up and tell you. And I was like, I thought about it. And I'm like, okay, so I can I can recall all those moments because mm-hmm. nothing's worse than being woken up at two o'clock in the morning and shooken by your wife telling you because to, when you're snoring you're deep you're yeah sleeping. you're, you're yeah, deep yeah, and yeah. so you're like startled. I wake up angry. If yeah, does that to me. I know, and, and I feel bad too because obviously uh, you know you're not sleeping. So tell me so I can change my position. But right. in the in the moment, I'm like, oh. yeah, but you know what? I, I flipped it's it on her. First reaction. She's like, well, and then she asked me. She goes, well, have I ever snored? I said, yeah, no, you've definitely snored, not a lot, probably just like what you're saying to me. And she goes, really? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, how come you don't ever say anything to me? I said, well, I imagine because you don't snore very often. If you're snoring, I think that man, she must be really tired. I don't want to. I don't want to disrupt that. <laughs> yeah. You're so much better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. she instantly feels hella guilty right after that. Oh, <laughs> man. She's just like, oh man. She goes, now I feel so terrible. I'm like, well, yeah. I assume that you wake me up because you're irritated. And I'm doing it all the time, but you're yeah, telling but me, like, you know. But I try to be self aware and think about you, and I know that you need <laughs> yeah. to sleep because you have important things to do. That's next exactly day. what I said. I want you rested. That's exactly. hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of uh, making money and education and stuff, there's so, you know, the markets change all the time very quickly. And especially now, it's such a dynamic market, especially with technology. There's a university, you ready for this, that mm. teaches people um, how to build a fans only page business. No, Stop there's, it, dude. Yes, no, there there's is. not. Yes, there is. Well, why wouldn't there be? It's a cash machine. It's an actual, it's an actual business. Um, and I'm going to read about it. It's free, by the way. Free. I'm not, it sounds like I'm promoting it. Everybody go to the clip. <laughs> yeah. It says in there, each course of study. New, new sponsor. I know. Yeah. I know. Isn't that <laughs> each course of study consists of a series of video classes and live stream special courses that will provide in-depth information about running a successful yeah. Influencer business. It's about fans only. Are you into yoga? Try these moves. So, so throwing the legs. So, literally, it's a university, an online university that teaches you know men and women uh, how to make money with these online 
online, you know, <laughs> have you found anything? Pages. I boy, I'm very curious on the money that's being made. Like we've talked about this so many times now, but I haven't read an article that like breaks down about how many millions. Of, I mean, I know it's millions on millions because just that one Disney actress that we talked about, she made two million in a in a day. Yeah, in in the fans only thing. So you got to well, think that there's. Well, I'll, I'll, I remember seeing it was like is this bar stool interview, and they're interviewing one of the uh, the girls that was on fans only, and she makes like forty thousand a month uh, just from her own little audience. It's not even that many. Yeah. Uh, so here's the here's the quote from one person. I logged online the first time in October 2011, an apartment with no furniture, and I promised myself. I wouldn't log off until I made enough money to cover my first rent payment. I made over seven thousand dollars in my first two weeks in the industry, and had no plans on looking back. You know, here's the thing about the uh, uh, hey, look: if you're you're making money, you're doing it legal, and people want to pay. I mean, that's all. Up I'm to you. totally for it, hey, dude. It's, this it's is America. That's right? fine. That's yeah. your own thing. But I will say this: you're you have a short window. Think about this because. You got to be smart, right? It's like if you're a professional athlete, especially if you play like football. Pro, you know, you you get signed to the NFL. Your your you know life, your experience, or how long you're going to last yeah. in the NFL is a short window. Make that money, invest it. Don't get excited. Oh, I make forty grand a month. Or like you, you said. just keep going more niche, more niche. Yeah. You oh, know, like <laughs> grandma only. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's true. You can, <laughs> you can just keep change. going. Yeah, let's be honest. <laughs> just as like you got to pivot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You just got to get a new demographic. <laughs> you're in the milf yeah. milf category now. Uh, change <laughs> your marketing a little. Now you're in the granny category. I mean, honestly, think about it. Like if you, it, it's. Uh, I don't know. Again, in this time that we, when I hear so much of this messaging around how much we hate America and it's so bad and it's so hard and it's so awful, it's like, I mean, if it was that tough, you could always do an OnlyFans page. <laughs> Jack, <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm saying? man. I mean, if it Here's was my real, evidence, yeah, it's yeah, always yeah, a button yeah. available. I mean, it's it's not Uber that hard. Driving, you know fans saying? only, yeah. <laughs> both of them together at the same time. <laughs> well, I will say Money. this in comparison to other traditional uh, markets where you're making money off of people. You know, looking at you naked or whatever, it's the best option so far. Because what was the options before? You're dancing yeah. on a stage, right. right? As a stripper, which probably way worse. You're in front and of way real less people. money. Oh, you're not God. making no. You're not making no seven thousand yeah. dollars a month. The like potential that. for harassment increases yeah. like tenfold. Or yeah. you're a sex worker, in which case that's even worse, right? Yeah. At least, at least you're in front of a camera, and they can't really do anything to you. They can't hurt you. But it lives forever. But it, oh, yeah, that's Ooh, not a bad. That's, that's it. That's it. I didn't even think of that. Uh, lives forever. Yeah, that would be terrible. Yeah. You know? yeah. Hey, mom. Uh, <laughs> My friend showed me this video. <laughs> Your kids are gonna watch that's a, it. That's what's gonna be interesting to me is you know fast forward twenty years from now, all of us though, I mean me included, like with things that I've put out there that I've said or you got photos or whatever that are floating around, like God damn, I got a look, couple out there. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, what about? I don't know if I, I don't know if I, <laughs> in the ether. I, I mean, know. you know, you know how like par like parents talk like the big the t the hard talk is like the sex talk with your kids or right. like that. That's like that's gonna be the the new hard talk is gonna be like explaining uh, yourself for the shit that, that's out wow. on the internet. Yeah. I actually think like, about that. Yeah, uh, so I'm at that pivotal point now too where. You know, with my oldest, he's like, it, like his sex talk's coming, right? It's coming. It's yeah. this this year, and like, so you can either opt out of sex education, or uh, you know, you can do their curriculum, or you can do it yourself. And so we decided to opt out and do it ourselves, and, and do you know some of the educating ourselves. So, but like he, we've been waiting for him to ask more questions about it, and it's coming up because of all the movies and references and things he's picking up on all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I got my work cut out for me, and it's like literally like tonight is is one of my first presentations. So I'm like <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Oh, oh really? Yeah. You, okay. So, okay. Wait. Wait. Well, so I mean, wait, I'm not wait. like super nervous. So where? Yeah. <laughs> where do you? Like, oh my god. Look. Where do you research this? <laughs> stuff i mean what's uh i mean uh, porn hubs anatomy not dude I'm, i start porn. with anatomy <laughs> you, know? you start with like uh like puberty and, and you know like go through that process with both you know uh boys and girls and how they change and here's what changes in them and like you know start like talking about the reproductive system and okay. then i'll start so, my way towards the so sex. if i could give you some advice because i think i did this really well with my son please right? do is yes. to be as honest as possible yes. use uh anatomically correct terms mm. so don't use like say penis vagina you know don't use puppets don't yeah don't use okay. like you know like your, your wiener yeah. or whatever <laughs> right because you otherwise you end up making them feel weird don't use yourself oh. as an example yeah. <laughs> i'm not going to do what i do on the podcast you guys all right don't worry about it one day you're going to look like
like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so much hair. <laughs> no, you, you, be be straightforward, honest. I shave, so it's fine. And, 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 and also make it feel so it's not shameful. So I had this conversation with my son, obviously, when he was in fifth grade, and I covered everything. I covered masturbation. I covered pornography. I talked about sex. This is what happens during sex. And then kids at that age, they're very innocent. And yeah. so he was asking me, like, well, why why would you want to do that? I remember that was this big question. Why I told, would you want to do yeah, that? Yeah, I was like, this is how sex happens. And I said, the sperm cells meet the egg cells. And this is how the sperm cells get to the egg cells. So I talked about sex and I explained it to him. And the look on his face, first he goes, well, how how are you going to get it in there? I'm like, oh, actually, you're, you, you become erect. And this is what that looks like. And then mm. he goes, why would you want to? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, you, <laughs> I there's said, magical rainbows yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a tough, it's a tough job, son. Yeah. Somebody's gonna it's do like it. a metal detector. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, when you really find this way in there, you want kids bad enough. You'll do it. No, I said, yeah. listen, I said, you're going to, it's You're going to want to, and you're going to really enjoy it. And it's so much so that it's going to drive your thoughts. Right. Then I talked about, about it pornography and sex, but now I got a daughter and not that she's a girl. That ne doesn't necessarily make it more difficult because I don't care. I'll just be very straight with her. It's that she's way more naive than my son, mm. like way more naive. Like I told you, we, we talked about because <clears throat> Jessica's pregnant, mm -hmm. it, we're talking about babies. And she's like, so how do they get the baby out? And it, do you have to, do you pray and God just puts the baby inside your belly? And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're way, <laughs> I mean, you're way more naive than my son. I know. When do you, when is like the, is it an age? Is it do you, as, as, a, as a parent, pregnant. as a parent, do you wait uh, until you think your kid's already kind of asking questions or searching on his own? When like, they ask questions, be honest. And only answer the question. There's no need to go further. That's number one. And then number two, yeah, there's a certain age because, especially for girls, my daughter's turning 11, girls go through puberty earlier than boys do. Yeah. So if you don't talk about this before it happens, yeah. that's a terrible way to introduce you know, this conversation. You don't want them to hear it from their friends. That their too. friends have terrible ideas. I've always, thought, I've always thought it was interesting that we we choose to do, like, it's fifth grade, right? Isn't that what yeah. it, it is? Like, Because I feel like that is... Good for girls, but I feel like that's early for most boys. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, I but- I think at least starting the conversation yes. is pretty healthy. Yes. And yeah, you're right, because girls do go through puberty before boys yeah. do. But I feel like because they're hanging around with girls in school, you probably want to- You can't tell one side and not the other side. Otherwise, yeah. they're going to find out from the girls. <laughs> yeah. And they'll be like, what are you guys talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody taught us that. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, it's it's important stuff. It's, no, that's it's good all, advice, yeah. man. I, I definitely want to be as open and honest. And we've, we've told them that the whole time you know, time is just like, if you have any questions, like we're, we're yeah. here and we're, you know, willing to explain whatever is yeah. on your mind. I remember too, my son's like, and he does the, he does the calculations, right? And he goes, oh, so you and mom have, have had sex twice. Cause you know, we have him and his, his sister. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. Twice. Yeah. Two it times. Worked. I'm yeah, like, both times. yeah. I remember like, no, actually you do it a lot more yeah. than that. There's a lot more reasons. You got to practice. Kind of like, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot more reasons. Kind of I don't know why I, I so want to hear Justin have this conversation because I just, the way you tell <laughs> stories, oh, the way you tell, the, the way you tell stories, I just want to uh, like, uh, <laughs> it'll, oh, it'll be, it'll be entertaining. I, uh, I got to make, make sure he's listening. I want to hear the analogy. Well, son, it's like a ramp and a water. right? You get really wet first. That's, good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, dude, I wanted to bring something up on the podcast. I don't want to go to it too 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 much of a serious note, but I did want to bring this up because I'm seeing a lot more of this happen uh, with people that I've known for a long time. You know, I, I have a obviously I'm on Facebook, but I have a private Facebook page just for friends and family. I don't do anything business wise with it. I don't do anything public. It's, it's you know I have lots of uh, you know I have pictures of my family on there stuff like that. And the people that I'm friends with <laughs> are people that I've known for a very long time. And people that I don't mind being in my, you know, seeing my, my private pictures of like my kids and stuff like that. And I'm seeing more and more of these kinds of posts, which are a little alarming to me. And they, they, they sound something like this, like, if you support candidate X, uh, then unfriend me right now. If right. you support Trump or Biden or whatever, yeah. then just unfriend we me. We don't need to be friends ever again. Yeah. Kind of a thing, like a total shut off of, you know, like we don't even want to discuss any like uh, opinion that's otherwise. Like you're just a, you're just a bad person or whatever. And this is- You're evil. This is crazy to me. Like the conversation has changed mm -hmm. from you that. have the wrong ideas uh, and so let's debate over them and argue over whose idea is the best to- you're an evil person. Mm -hmm. You're not. It's not your idea. You're just an evil person. This is dangerous because when you're confronted with evil, if you really believe someone or something is evil, 
There is no negotiating. There is no debating. There is no democracy. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is you want to punch them. You want to kill them. You want to silence them. And if they do win uh, an election and their ideas get put forth, their evil ideas, in which case, by all means necessary, should we stamp that out? Very, very dangerous and uh, you know uh, idea. It's a very, very uh, dangerous precedent, and I think we need to combat that because the reality is, and this is the truth. Okay, half the country, whatever other half uh, from you uh, is, half the country is not evil. If if half the country was evil, organized society as we know it would not exist. It just wouldn't mm. work. There's no way. Most people are good. They just have, and we all want similar things. We just have different ideas of the best way to get there. That's it's, all. It's not only that. It's we can't have progress that way. It's you're impossible. St you're stuck in emotion. God, I was. We watched this uh, interview that Tom Billu did. I tell you what, man. I, w I was talking to Tom the other day. And oh, like, you're talking about uh, what's his name? Vusi V U S S I. I can't pronounce his last name. Yeah. Just, oh, Vusi Thembekweo. Thembekweo. What an incredible oh, South Africa. Maybe the maybe the best interview that I've had or I've seen Tom do. Oh, and I loved it. Yeah. I've been going down the rabbit hole with him because we were talking to him a couple weeks ago. And you know, anytime I talk to him, I go, you know what? Let me see what he's up to. <clears throat> I know we're all very busy and we're all kind of doing our own thing. And that guy, again, like puts out more content than we do, which uh, you guys know what it takes for all of us to put out the content we do. And it, he's got so much good stuff. It's hard sometimes to sift through some of this stuff and came across this interview. And this interview, in my opinion, is, uh, it, first of all, everybody should listen yeah. to this, especially in, in the time that we're at right now. It's so I uh, wish it was on major media. Like everybody had exposure to this conversation. It, it's, it's so important it's right now. It's so perfect for the context of today. The message that, that uh, Vusi was communicating, I mean, here's a guy who grew up in South Africa, um, you know, very difficult times. Apartheid was uh, a real thing, you know, uh, as a kid. Watched his father get gunned down. Right. Uh, today, he is one of the top public speakers in the world. He's worth um, half a billion dollars, is a CEO of a venture capital company. And when you hear him communicate, he's just, he, his uh, his mindset and the and you, you really understand why he is as successful as as successful as he is, and that that particular interview was phenomenal. I oh, think Tom did such a, great job. a such a powerful interview. Yeah, and, and Tom crushed it, dude. It was such a great conversation. So, I mean, the, if you guys have not gone over to uh, Impact Theory already, I mean, we've we've taught we've been singing Tom's praises since day one since he's been on here. He's a good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. Love the guy as a as a person, and then what he's creating as a business is just it's amazing what he's doing. Yeah, and uh, you know, if you really want inspiration motivation if you want to change your paradigm, which I think is really important because it's so easy to get stuck. And, you know, Vusi talks about this in the interview. It's easy to get stuck in this uh, identity, right. um, you know, veneer, uh, this 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 filter that, every, that you see everything through. And, and when the you're- The story in, that everybody's telling you. That's it. And, and when you get in that, whatever you believe is true, right? So if you think mm -hmm. that you're, you're not going to succeed or you think that you've got- all these things against you and it's impossible to even try. Oh, that's what's what becomes true. true. It's totally true. And so, you know, his podcast in general is a great place to go to challenge your own belief system uh, and especially challenge the way you view yourself. I think that's one of the most important things you could do. Um, one of the reasons why I love fitness so much. Yeah. One of the reasons why I love fitness so much is when you train clients for a long period of time, you start to get good at it. You start to figure out ways to help people achieve the almost impossible as uh, evidenced by the by the actual data, right? The data shows that 80 plus percent of people who try to lose weight, mm. who try to get in shape will fail and they will fail repeatedly. So it's a very, very difficult thing, okay? We, we can't get around that. So when you work with people for a long time, you start to figure out how to get that failure rate from 80% down to 50%, then down to whatever percent. And then you start to get success rates of 90% plus. And you know what it revolves around. You definitely need to know what you're doing. You need to know exercise. Mindset. It's all yeah. mindset. Yeah. It's so it's so crazy. It's all around mindset and people who are stuck in that 
bad relationship with food mindset. They're stuck in that uh, exercise hurts and sucks because it's difficult mindset and they're, or they're stuck on the, I just want the goal and the result. Uh, the journey sucks the whole time. Isn't that mindset. crazy? What, like how much our jobs as trainers, like evolved and changed over your course of your career. Oh, like totally. the beginning was all about, you know, breaking down macros and yeah. program design and teaching uh, exercise and biomechanics and, you know, me knowing what's the latest study and research that's Proving coming up. You know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like the whole, thing was always centered around that and even the questions that you get so it's hard it just perpetuates that right mm -hmm. so it's the story it's the identity that we were being told so getting out of that framework and going like none of this stuff and i remember having that epiphany as a trainer is like none of this stuff is really helping a majority of my clients sure there's a few people that were self-motivated motivated already on the right path i plugged in the numbers for them or i gave them a few things and they were successful but that number was like yeah you know, less than 20%. It's like 10% of the people are like that. The other ones were wanting all that information or thinking that's the information that they wanted, but really they had to reframe their mindset to ever even get to that point. And you, so I ended up spending 90 plus percent of my time speaking to that than ever breaking down macros and programs. I just love so how that. Tom finds these guests. You know, he just, uh, you again, this, I think this is a big problem with media in general is just like what's perpetuated out there and who's who's out there that people are looking up to in terms of success. And uh, I think like we need more conversations like this. We need more examples of people that I didn't even know, you know, who this guy was. And I'm so impressed and, and so just like taken back at, at what he's accomplished. Well, the re I think the reason has to do, and Tom will say this himself, is look at how he grew up. You know, for right. all for all intents and purposes, statistically speaking, he should not have become as successful as he became because of the way he grew up. It reminds me of Adam's story. Uh, statistically, Adam should not be successful. You probably should be a drug addict or your suicide rate should be high because of the way you grew up. And what was the difference? What was the difference? It wasn't your circumstances. Right. The way you grew up was the way you grew up. It was the mindset. And the, fitness is great because we can apply it to something so black and white. It's easy to convince someone to change their mindset around fitness. I should say easier than it is to change their mindset around life in general. But it's a great entry point. And so that's why I think Tom finds those types of guests um, and why it's such a great show to listen to. If you're into, you know, self-awareness and, and personal growth and all those things, and here's a, here's a tip that I learned a long time ago that I that's really benefited me, is that you know uh, we understand how evolution works. Um, you know, we understand how biology or evolution of biology works, right? Certain traits uh, that are advantageous continue to get passed on. Ones that are not advantageous tend to die out, and that's how we evolve and change biology. But we forget that ideas also have to go through that process. And so good ideas that work tend to stick around. So if you want to change your paradigm or really understand how to make yourself successful, look at the ancient practices. Look at the, you know, religion is one of them. You can look at spiritual practices. You can look at philosophy. Martial arts is wonderful because many martial arts are very, very old. They've been around a long time. Look at those philosophies. They, didn't ex they don't exist because uh, they didn't work. They exist because they worked. And they can apply to you know to to most people. Yeah, you so, know we were talking about how all of us didn't get very good sleep uh, and stuff. And one of the things that I also connected, which is, and I didn't bring it up, I didn't even realize that Felix Gray was a commercial today. And one of the things I did not do is I came into bed. I'm talking to Katrina, and then also we got on this house conversation kick, and then we're both like looking on our phones, like, oh, at all yeah. these places that'll kill you. And I didn't grab my Felix Gray's, and it's already like ten o'clock at night. And I swear, staring at that blue screen, especially now that I've been so consistent with wearing them, mm -hmm. and I, and it's been, and I'm so good about it that the the few times now I know, like that's where how I can really tell is like once you've been really consistent. And I feel like this is any practice, right, with nutrition or exercise or anything you do. It's like you got to be consistent with it first, and then it's the removing it, and then you see the contrast. Yes, and see the contrast to really evaluate how beneficial. Because if you give someone a pair of blue blocker glasses and say, "Hey, these will change your sleep forever," and they do it one time, and they're like, "I don't know, maybe it did, maybe it did." It's kind of the same. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't really feel anything different. It's like, okay, do this consistently, okay, for a while, then remove it out, and then pay attention to the contrast. That's when you can really tell. Well, the here, difference. here's your evidence. You ever wake up in the middle of the night to? go pee okay most of us have right do you wake up in the middle of night and turn all the lights on real bright to go pee or yeah. do you do you subconsciously oh, know Courtney does that to me keep the lights does she down really? yeah i can't stand she oh just my turns God. all the lights on. i walk with my eyes closed on. bro me too yeah, yeah. 
I, oh, can't, yeah. I can't have any lights on. Now, Jessica feels her way through the room, yeah, and so I got to like, be careful ah. what I leave on the floor. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's happened before where I hear poof in the middle of the night. Oh, shit, uh-huh. what's the matter? You a swear word right yeah. afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> oh, you left so. But you know what I mean? Like, subconsciously, you know, or, you know, automatically, you know, don't turn all the lights on and don't even open my eyes all the way because otherwise, yeah, yeah. Uh, it tells my brain I'm awake. It's harder to fall back asleep. Yeah, yeah. That's what the light does. That's why the blue light blocking glass. That's how I know they work so well. Yeah, right that's what they do. It's when I don't, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dude, I, I, I mentioned Mark. Martial arts, and I just re- I just remembered. I want to plug this Instagram page. It's oh, hilarious. Oh God, the it's one called, you sent over. It's called Mick Dojo Life. <laughs> so I so I've been into martial arts for most of my life, just as a fan. I loved Bruce Lee, and then I did him as a kid and all that stuff. And I remember, I'm old enough to remember martial arts world before UFC and martial arts world after UFC. Before UFC, there was a lot of this like mysticism and. You know, those martial arts, like, well, you could hit a pressure point, make the person pass out, and these weird martial arts where people are knocking each other out by barely touching them and all that stuff. And then UFC came around and basically dispelled all that stuff. Yeah. I didn't realize that some of these martial arts still exist. <laughs> so this page shows some of these fake martial arts. There's this one dude. that He's got, like, five attackers coming to him, and he, like, waves his hand. He doesn't even touch them, dude. <laughs> like David it's just Car- his energy. David yeah, Carradine. Him over. He throws his chi at them, and yeah. then they're like, oh, and they literally pass out. Ooh, like, for reals, oh. they'll actually pass out because they got knocked out by his chi. And there's, yeah. this, there's this other dude that will hit, like, a couple pressure points and yeah. the, dude, the dude falls asleep. I feel like I'm some like, of those oh like televangelists have gone to those same classes, right? <laughs> you, you, get, you get some people like, ah, you know, be gone, demon. They fall just like, you know, the same dojo. It's yeah. all psychosomatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, there was this one uh, investigative journalist that went to one of these martial arts schools where this guy knocks people out with just his chi. And so he went to get knocked out mm-hmm. by this guy and the dude couldn't knock him out, obviously. And he says, oh, you must be your tongue is in the wrong position or in this position, it's blocking my chi energy. So you're actually defending, <laughs> you're defending my chi really well. <laughs> what, dude? <laughs> Shut your mouth. I and, love it, dude. Anyway. Okay. Hey, have you, uh, Adam, you were talking about uh, the dog food you were getting from public goods for the dogs? No, I'm gonna, so that? I'm ordering it. So I haven't used it yet. Uh, you know, I tell you what, they're... Um, you know, we have a, we have a couple brands not only that we've worked with in the past that we work with currently now that there's some overlap, right? That they they sell similar things and uh, but totally different, right? Like as far as what the company is like, Public Goods is if you're looking for a place where you can get things for like close to wholesale type prices, but with natural ingredients, good for the environment, and direct to consumer, so straight to you. That that's where they are a huge win. The mm-hmm. price point is crazy. I was like comparing some of the other things with some of the other companies that we've worked with. Like, oh my god, like they are literally like a tenth of the price. Yeah, and their stuff is is on point. So I'm like, you know what? I haven't. I'm like really finicky about the the dog food that I I use for the boys, and so I don't normally like to like kind of go out. But I'm like, you know what? Everything else that I've I've bought from Public Goods has been fire. So let me see. And the dog food is ridiculously cheaper than the dog food I pay for right now. So I want to try it out and see how the boys. It's, a, it's one of the. It's a member. It's like a membership service. It's like a Costco. company. Like it's Costco. Like a, yeah, it's like a, a Costco online. Yeah, but mm-hmm. and their their eco friendly approach I think is the best uh, that I've seen. Like you yeah. can, you'll get a product that comes in a container like soap for it's example. Like minimalist. Yeah, very minimalist, feel. right? Yeah. So you get the soap container. Then you can get refill uh, for that same container, but now it's in packaging. That is far more eco-friendly, which I think I've always said, I've always thought I should say yeah. that that's the best approach. Oh, like I've already got this more plastic. More companies need to do that. Yeah. Like I got this plastic container for my soap or whatever. Why don't I, why don't they sell refill packets yeah. that take up less space, less garbage? I feel like the company would save money, so it would be more profitable. Well, yeah. I feel like sometimes we kind of harp a little bit hard on, you know, some of the environmental pushes people make, but I mean, these are real problems and they're, they're so, you know, solvable if like more companies do these types of things collectively. And uh, this actually brings up, I was actually looking at uh, Lego as you know, how humongous like Lego is as a company and their entire product is plastic. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they've been having this real challenge as to make an initiative towards moving away from, you know, actual plastic and making it more like bio, uh, 
like degradable or, or like out of some kind of a plant derivative uh, to, oh, to make to make this type of a, of, of of a polymer that's similar that has the same feel. So it's shiny. The the problem that they're having is that like the the colors change a little bit, and then you know when you try to pull off the Lego, like they're having a little bit of issue with that in comparison to plastic. Uh, but they're getting really close, and so they put all this money into the future. So that way, because I mean their footprint, you know, in terms of like putting out plastic is insane oh, yeah. uh, in comparison to a lot of other, other companies. But I but mean, these are like real things that if we get more companies all together collectively, like thinking in a better direction, it's going to make a massive is difference. It, are they using hemp or do you know what they're doing? I, yeah, I don't know what the actual plant, uh, you know, uh, uh, formula is that they're, that they're experimenting yeah. with, but they're getting, I guess they've, they've come close to like a real solid answer. Yeah, you know doesn't, what? Doesn't hemp still have traces of, of uh, THC in it or no? Is it completely uh, tiny? Is I, mean, it I don't still think a, you could take like a hemp I'm Lego. Just, I'm just picturing my son sucking on his Legos all the time. It's like, <laughs> it's, I don't know if hemp would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, hey. He might be just chill. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, he loves really his really Legos. Yeah. He's always in a good mood after yeah. he plays with his Legos. You know, yeah. you know there's this interesting statistic that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but as societies become wealthier and more prosperous on the way to becoming wealthy they produce more waste they produce more carbon or they have a larger carbon footprint uh, and this is uh, because the, the the desires and needs of the society on the way up to prosperity are houses and we need food we need you know shelter education and this you know energy this is most important right now once they achieve a certain level of prosperity though you start to see car the carbon footprint start to drop considerably and waste starts to drop considerably per capita because as the society becomes more prosperous, they start to, and they get all their, their needs met, the, the most basic needs, they start to value taking care of the planet. And mm -hmm. so, so companies like this are exploding. Uh, and Lego, this is obviously a market demand. Why would they do this if, if they knew that, yes, it's good for the environment, but it's also a market demand for it. Oh. Or like public goods, mm -hmm. why is a company like that doing so well? Uh, have great products, good prices, but also eco-friendly. And we've seen a lot of companies do this. It's because uh, we're prosperous and people now value that stuff. They can. Yeah, they can value that stuff. Right, right. First question is from E. Stutz 10. Is there such a thing as too deep of a squat or is it only limited by one's mobility? You, If you go lower than your stability and control can handle, then it's too low. And so what does that look like? It depends. It depends on the person. For some, for some people, that may be parallel, may be too low for them because once they go parallel, they lose stability. They don't have the mobility to go low. Things break down and now it becomes an exercise where the injury risk is too high or they're strengthening their, their a recruitment pattern that isn't favorable. So it really depends on your mobility. But if you have phenomenal strength, mobility, and stability, going as low as you possibly can is totally fine. It's pretty much limitless. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. I, I, I This is where I see value in like using your phone to record yourself. I know that looks really super douchey in the gym when people do this. It's but the, the new norm. It, it, but it is. Yeah, it's become such the norm that I do see places where there's value to this. And, you know, assessing your squat and looking at it and saying like and being able to be objective and going, hey, that something's not right there. This doesn't look really nice or your hips are moving or you have a butt wink or your mm. head's fo protruding forward or your elbows aren't underneath your wrist. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that could be breaking down that maybe while you're in the, the, the moment of getting the weight up and you're focused on that, you're not really seeing it, that mm. I think there's a lot of value in you looking at your squat and saying, okay, <clears throat> there's breakdown here. It's not a good squat because... I mean, if you look at Olympic lifters, who are probably the best example of like full depth squats, oh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Olympic lifters at the bottom of their squat, it's beautiful. I mean, I mean, if you look at the the mechanics of it and the, look at take a snapshot of what they look like at the very the deepest point, um, and look at what their squat looks like, it is. I mean, the way their their torso, the way their posture is, where their head and neck is, the way their feet are, the where their mm -hmm. knees are at, where their hips are positioned. Uh, the bar path, all those things, that is like the most beautiful squat. And now mine does not look like that, but I'm always working towards that. And I'm always picking myself apart when it's when something is off and there's work to be done there. And so 
this is where I think that everybody at some point should do this. Like at some point, whether you you prop it up yourself or you have a spouse or a friend or somebody record your squat and then really pick it apart. And if you don't, okay, if you don't have good form all the way down when you hit acid grass, then there's there's works to there's work to be right. done. Now the counter I'll hear people say is, oh, I know people who Olympic lift and they've got injuries you've got knee pain and they blew out this and they blew out that what you need to understand by the way is that especially competitive lifters people who compete in lifting they're pushing their bodies yeah, they're to stretching the, their capacity absolute well, you, know, you know that sounds like to me is like somebody who points out a nascar driver who wrecks everyone correct yeah. it's like correct. so you don't feel safe driving with him yeah and a you normal know, road yeah and a normal car <laughs> yeah, and a normal road exactly. like no, of course not the guy's a professional and he's pushing the limits you yeah. know so yeah. Yeah, I think too. Like, I mean, we have we have like a test that you can do, uh, where we have a stick that goes down your back, and you, you could get all these uh, points of contact established. Really, to to, to hyper focus is is crucial for me. Like through something like a squat, so that way you know where the breakdown starts to occur, and you can kind of set uh, you know thresholds and limitations uh, for yourself to to work on. And so I want to stay uh, in that spot where I feel like. You know, I, I was I was I was releasing those those pressure points, and now I want to work on that specifically. If you're trying to figure this out, or this is a question you're asking yourself, like, and you have not taken the MapsPrimeWebinar.com, if you have not gone through that, where Justin takes you through this full assessment, what he's what he's talking about right now, it's absolutely free. Okay, it's free. You go on that website, click it, watch it. It'll take about. 45, 50 minutes of your time. You'll figure out a lot of issues, yes. a lot of ways to fix your mobility issues and get a better squat. And what that is, that's that's part of our MAPS Prime. So I know like one of the best and worst things that we ever did, right? So the here's the the, the dumb thing that Mind Pump did when we first started. We were really, um, we this is our massive egos. We really believe oh, no. that we're going to change the world so much that we decided to create our own lexicon, right? So we're going to fucking change <laughs> terms, right? Yeah. When really Maps Prime, what Maps Prime is and what it represents, by the way, and that this webinar gives you a taste of that and gives you a, a big portion of that, is it's the assessment portion of being a personal trainer. Every good personal trainer does a a, a full assessment on somebody's movement before they take the mic. If not, run. Okay, if your trainer does not assess the way you squat, hinge, move, rotate before they take you on a bunch of exercises and they don't do that to you, get the fuck out of there because that's not a good. That's trainer. like a mechanic not looking at your car before they right, start telling right. you what to fix. So that really that that program is what like the beginning of everything looked like for us. It's just a combination of all three of us. It's all three of our minds of the things that we thought were the most valuable things that we wanted to assess on a, on a client's movement before we put them into any program. And so that's what it really is. So if you, if you don't own it at the bare minimum, get your ass over to the, the, the prime pro or the maps prime webinar and watch it for free. Next question is from janky garage. Jim, can you provide some stuff? Tips for dips. Oh, dips. <laughs> tips you for know, dips. You know, it's it's funny. When you list the top, when you ask the average lifter to list the top best upper body muscle building uh, exercises, the ones that are the most functional, that build the most muscle, give you the most bang for your buck, for some reason, body weight dips oftentimes doesn't appear in that top lift and or, or list. And I think it's just because they kind of fell out of favor because the reality is uh, body weight dips done properly – is easily one of the best exercises you could do for your shoulders, triceps, and even your chest. It's a mm -hmm. It's like a pull-up um, for your back, except this is more. They're for, incredibly is, difficult for a lot of people. They're very difficult, and so you. you I mean, just being good. You so you just pointed to the bat, the pull-up. Like just being good at pull-ups and dips would build an incredible upper up, by itself. Yes, absolutely, those two things. If you got really good at pulling your body weight up and dipping really well, enough to where you got so good that you can do 15 reps of both those, no problem. So you have to add weight. You have an amazing body, you upper have, body. You have a great upper body, absolutely. Guaranteed. So here's some tips for dips. Now, if you have the strength to do a body weight dip, start at the top, grip the handles really tight, and maintain good tension. Lean slightly forward. Do not drop down below the point you lose control and tension. This is the big mistake I see with people with dips is they challenge the depth past the point that they have uh, stability or proper stability. So they go all the way down and they tend to relax at the bottom and then press their way up. That's a recipe for shoulder uh, injury. It's a mm -hmm. recipe for, uh, for failure. So always have full control throughout the whole thing. Now, if you can't do a body weight dip, which a lot of people can't because it's a, it's a full body weight exercise, 
One easy way to get better at them is to use a resistance band, put it around the bars, both bars, step on it or put your put knee your on, it, on it, and now you have assistance. And you can do body weight dips with assistance. This is how I train my son when I have him do them. I, I put the band around the two handles. He puts his foot in there, mm -hmm. and then he the band helps him so he can get better at the motion of dips. And then, of course, as he gets stronger, I'll take the band off. So I have to give... Uh Justin, some cool credit here because you know there's we, and we don't talk a lot about this on the air, um, but you know when we all got together and and started working together, there there are a handful of things I think each of us probably really learned from the other guys, even with all the experience that we had and maybe we were familiar with certain things, but the other guy was way more into it, and so it really kind of opened your eyes for things. And Justin was like Justin's like hardcore about tension, like he was like the stick mobility thing. You know, those that have been listening for a long time knew the the whole invention thing that he did like and so he was all about like all these tension moves and something that I used to notice when I would do dips cold like if I came in cold and I went over to the dip sometimes my shoulder would bother my shoulder a little bit it bothered my elbow a little bit mm -hmm. like um, and it would it feel have this kind of uncomfortable feeling when I did it and something I thought you know what Th this is an, an area where I bet if I did like a tension exercise before I actually do the perform the movement I could probably gain some real value here. and so what it looked like is this a lot of places, you go to a dip, uh, the dip bar, and the dip bar is elevated. You got to step up to it, and then you get on it, and then you come down in it, and then you drop down into this like new range of motion area, and that's where people either hurt themselves or mm -hmm. their shoulder feels clicky and weird. So instead of that, like I, and I'll either use a bench to slide up, or I'll find one. Or I'll, in our case, we can we can manually lower eyes. I want to be able to stand in it. Like I can always bend my knee and do a dip. So I want to be able to stand in it, and then I actually start in the most deep position I want to go. So I actually bend my knees, let let the dip, and I want to I want to position my elbows right where I want them to be. I want my chest and my shoulders right where I want to be. And then I create tension. And I create tension in that position for about five seconds. And then I push out of it from that that position. Mm -hmm. When I when I started doing that, I completely eliminated all that weird clicking in my shoulder or a little bit of pain that I would feel sometimes of being cold and dropping into the dip. So going into it in the deepest range of motion where I'm supporting myself with my legs, so it's not like I'm putting my body weight there, and then actually creating tension in that position for a good five to 10 seconds and then coming out of it to start, mm -hmm. man, it made a big difference on my dips. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, yeah, that's a great tip. I also think too, like, um, the hand position itself, like I know with some clients of mine, they would feel like an immediate sort of impingement in the shoulder based off of like how narrow or how wide uh, their their hand grip was. Uh, just to kind of manipulating that on your own just initially to uh, feel where you're most comfortable. And a lot of it, times it, it, it emulates and matches like where you would grab the bar for an overhead press. Um, and so for me, I would experiment with that. Uh, definitely adding the tension is is a panty dropper. I'm going to go ahead and throw that out there again. Uh, that's, it's, it's a big move to, uh, uh, you know, to put you into the right uh, direction and then challenge it too with instability. Yeah. And one other tip, I like this one too, is to, you can practice negatives on dips pretty well. So what you would do is you bring a bench up to the bar, you'd stand in the dip uh, uh, apparatus, so you're kind of already at the top, bend your knees, hold that tension, and then slowly lower yourself until you touch the floor with your feet and then get out, mm -hmm. rest for about five seconds, and then try that again. If you're not strong enough to do a dip, you probably are strong enough to lower yourself with control. And so that's one way to slowly build up your strength. Next question is from Dina Larson. On a recent episode, you guys talked about how a pound of muscle burns approximately 50 extra calories, but I recently read that this is a myth and a pound of muscle only burns an extra f uh, 7 to 15 calories. Can you clarify which is true? I'm so glad you mm. put this question in here, Sal, and this is, uh, you know, it's been a while since I got fired up about the, the fitness space and how much it annoys the fuck yeah. out of me. This feels like a gotcha moment. Yeah, this is the this is the thing that I can't stand about us, us as a whole, as a, as a fitness space, is that we get into this pissing contest of who is more right, and we're, and which, okay, there's also the other side of that. I do appreciate, you know, the the debate and then studies and that are disproving other studies and us growing and learning. And so I can appreciate some of it, but where I'm very careful about how I present information is that the the desired outcome is to actually help people, right? The desired outcome is to get people to move in the right direction. 
And so what I don't want to do is I don't want to overwhelm people all the time with what the latest scientific study proved or proved wrong or proved right if it's not going to really help my client. This is an example of this. This is an example of you can read like a, a ton of different research around this that like will disprove that. And I'm telling you firsthand experience from training tons and tons of people that when you put on, okay, three to five pounds of muscle, someone, they are able to eat a ton more calories than what before. And by a ton more, I mean like hundreds of more calories, not 10 or 15 more calories. They can eat a lot more. Now, what I don't know for sure is if that is just because of the lean body mass that they built, three pounds of muscle. I'm not sure what is good. And I think it's very um, arrogant for anyone to claim that they know either. The metabolism is one of the most complex things. Metabolism, gut, brain, universe. Those are like the fucking part of the hardest things that we have tried to figure out and we're still and learning. Women. Yeah, yeah, that was, that's <laughs> five right yeah, there, right? Justin. I didn't that in there. <laughs> yeah. Scoring points with our female. I know right? you are today. You're on one. So <laughs> hey. those no, those are those these are the things that we're still learning a ton about. And you know, then what ends up happening is people real go, oh, it's only seven calories. So why would I care about putting on five pounds of muscle to my body, it's only going to mean I can eat 35. It means what I can have a bite it more. Do, it doesn't work. So there's two things here we need to pay attention to. Number one, okay, if it speeds up your metabolism. Okay. So whether it's 15 calories, 50 calories, adding muscle means you burn more calories. That's a fact. But also here's number two. Okay. There's a lot going on in the process of sending the signal to build muscle. There's a lot going on. Part of that is telling your body you need more calories, black and white, because you have more muscle tissue. But another part of that is telling your body you don't have to be as efficient with calories. There's a lot of energy, call it what you will, for lack of a better term, energy waste that happens when your body doesn't feel like it needs to conserve every single calorie. You could take someone and add no muscle to their body and get their body to burn more calories through changing their sleep, through lifting weights, through making them healthier. You'll see that their body just burns more. You could change someone's hormones and have their body burn more calories or less calories without a necessary change in body mass. I've observed this time and time again. I could take someone, not have them lose muscle uh, yet, they will eventually, but not have them lose muscle and have them uh, their bodies start to slow down their caloric burn. Your body becomes more or less efficient with its calorie burn or calorie storage based upon the signals that it receives. So it's actually more of a multi-pronged approach. Lifting weights tells your body to build more muscle. Is that alone going to speed up your metabolism? Probably not. You also need to feed yourself a little bit more. Now this is telling your body, hey, it's okay to become less efficient with calories because we got calories coming in. The third thing is let's not do things that make our body feel like it needs to store calories because it's under stress. In other words, don't avoid sleep. Make sure you get good sleep because when you avoid sleep, you're stressed. Now your body thinks it needs to hold on to calories. So get good sleep, have good relationships. Your hormone profile needs to be pretty good or healthy. That typically is a reflection of your lifestyle. When that's all happening, your body becomes looser with how it uses calories. It actually, the studies have shown it'll burn more calories just to maintain your body heat. And you'll and that right there will burn sometimes hundreds of calories more every single day. And I'll back Adam up. I've seen this happen uh, so often and so consistently that it's a rule. I could speed someone's metabolism up every single time by applying those things. Every single time. It's not only that. They're, they're also teasing out. I mean, this is when we get into arguing over semantics, which annoys the shit out of me. It's like, Okay, if someone added five pounds of muscle, so the body is always going to adapt, right? It's always going to respond to whatever signal you're sending to it to get better, improve, or go the other way, an atrophy. If you've done the right work eating correctly and training and increasing your training volume to actually add three to five pounds of muscle, there's also that extra volume that you're having to train in order to keep that muscle. Because if you stop training that volume, that muscle would atrophy. So then there's also going to be more calories that are burnt in your workout. But they're teasing that out because that's movement, right? So they're not, they're teasing out that you have to move more in order to keep those or lift more in order to keep those uh, that muscle. That they're looking at just what is muscle using. Right. Muscle is only using based off these this new research seven to fifteen calories more a day, and we've been telling people it's this fifty. Well, what about? the work that that person has to continually do now in order to maintain that new muscle mass that they have built on their body. Yeah. you got to bring that into yeah, consideration. Yeah, and this is just a very simplistic black and white view of a very complex mm -hmm. uh, thing like metabolism. Like we all know, common sense, okay? We all know somebody who's 150 pounds, 
not a lot of muscle, not a lot of body fat either, and they can eat three times as much as your other friend who's 230 pounds and seems to gain body fat uh, all the time uh, very easily. What's going on? The fatter person probably actually has more lean body mass than the person who's skinny. So there's a lot more going on here. But here's the fact. This is actually what matters. Okay. This, this, these, the, you know, studies that show, oh, it's this many calories, that many calories. Okay. That doesn't matter. Here's what matters building muscle and doing the things that encourage muscle building, speed up the metabolism. That's right. the bottom line. If you want a faster metabolism, which will make staying lean easier. Um, in a modern world where food is accessible, where we're sedentary all the time so we don't, and we're busy, so we don't have the time to go and do tons of cardio all the time, if we want to have a fast metabolism in that context, yeah. then try to build muscle. That's the bottom line. The reason line. why I hate this stuff is because what this also could – the person who's good with math would go, wait a second – why should I put all this effort into trying to build two pounds of muscle when I know that actually 25 jumping jacks burns the same amount yeah, of calories? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It Instead of me, so I'm not going to go lift weights anymore because my trainer told me that it speeds my metabolism. He's wrong. Yeah, 30 calories? Yeah, I could just stand I could, while I play video yeah, games. Yeah, I could literally just <laughs> yeah. do 30 crunches and 25 jumping jacks, burn more calories per day, and not have to stress about... No, see, that's what I don't like about stuff like this mm -hmm. is when we get into these pissing contests of who's more right... The truth is this: like if you if you build muscle, if you put if you go through a muscle building program where you add three to five, I promise you, yeah. go do it and tell me if you think you're eating more calories now than what you mm. were before. Next question is from <laughs> Miller's time. Some people claim calories in versus calories out is what determines fat gain, while others say if you eat healthy whole foods, no matter how much you eat, you will not gain fat. What is your take on this? Well, that last part's not true. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack here. Okay, number one, you can't get around this. This is a a law of physics. Okay, if you are burning, you know, so much energy, if you're burning two thousand cal. By the way, calories are just a unit uh, that we use to measure energy. Okay, so if you're burning two thousand calories and you're eating three thousand calories, the extra thousand calories doesn't just evaporate uh, into thin air. Um, it gets converted and stored uh, as body fat or maybe converted into muscle or whatever. But energy does not get created uh, and it does not get destroyed. It just gets transferred. This is a law of physics and thermodynamics. So that's number one, okay? But here's number two. Losing weight and gaining weight or, or just losing fat doesn't guarantee that you're going to get healthier either. There's a lot of people that lose weight. There's actually, in fact, people who are underweight oftentimes have worse health than people who are slightly overweight. So there's also the health component, okay? So you have to consider calories if you want to burn uh, body fat. That's a must. You are not going to get around that. I don't care how healthy your diet is. If you eat too many calories, you'll gain body fat. That's just the bottom line. But we also have to understand this. Calories are important. So is what makes up those calories in terms of your, of your total health, okay? Now, you can get away with more when your calories are low, but it still makes a big difference. So you got to look at your calories. You got to look at your macronutrients, especially the essential ones like proteins and fats. You got to hit the essential uh, numbers on those. Otherwise, your body can't function. And then what makes up your diet determines how you feel. It determines um, you know, your appetite. It'll mm. determine uh, other issues or, or factors that determine your overall health. In fact, uh, studies will show that people who eat a whole food, Mediterranean-style diet that are slightly overweight will have better health than people who eat a lower-calorie diet that's made up of foods that tend to be heavily processed. So health is is another, another factor. So it's not just about weight loss or weight gain. It's also health. So both important, but the last part of that question is false. Uh, you, you'll gain weight if you eat too many calories regardless of how healthy or unhealthy the yeah, food is. You can't avoid that part of it. No. And, and I think, uh, yeah, the message of health is a big one because, and that's why you, you see that a lot in uh, these influencers that really, you know, are, are definitely steering people towards whole foods. I think, you know, they, they may be doing it in, in an, uh, you know, in a way that's not really that um, wrapped in, in truth. So a lot of times it's, you know, you can eat all this healthy food. You're not going to gain any fat. Uh, that's not true either. Uh, 
it, it really is like you, you don't want to be fighting yourself internally, uh, you know, while you're trying to make progress. So whatever you're eating needs to benefit you from within and, and keep everything healthy and working optimally. But also calories are are the consideration. If I'm, I'm above calories in a surplus, you know, I am going to gain weight. Well, the, the, the part of the statement that makes it false is that no matter how much you eat, Right. right, like the, if you're right. I mean, if you ate ribeye steaks and bananas every day till till you hit six thousand calories, weird, weird combination. I know, I don't know. I just I just thought about their high calorie. I thought high calorie and easy to eat. Right, you I could probably, it. yeah. I feel it's like a steak it's, and steak and banana diet. That's yeah. a that's a that's a bestseller yeah. for uh, yeah. yeah. I just think it high calorie, Popular, high Cuba. calorie. And you, could, I mean, if I was, I mean, if I was like on a mission to eat whole foods and get to a ton of calories, that's what came to mind: fruit and steak. Right, that's what just how I was thinking. So <laughs> my point though is that you absolutely can get fat just eating whole foods if you really try it. Now. Where this comes from, I think, and and where hopefully the, whoever said this or was alluding to this, is that it's a really hard thing to do, and I, that I'll get behind, right? So I, I I've tried I've done this with many clients and said, listen, okay, I'm not going to tell you how many calories you can or can't eat. Right. Mm -hmm. All I want you to do is eat whole, and if you're hungry, eat, but you have to eat from these these food groups, these choices. Yes. Okay. The and majority I, of people can't overeat. Those right. Foods. Exactly. Can't. And and a most and the only ones that have ever came back and failed this test, and they look back at me, I put on five pounds, Adam. What the fuck? And then I go, okay, let's talk about. Did you stick to that? Ninety percent of the time, all that. Wait a second. Ninety percent of the time. What about the other ten percent? Well, yeah. there was a few times where I had this or I had that. I said, okay, so you got full off the Whole Foods, and then you hijacked your palate and your and your body's natural signals that tell you that you're full and then you went and had some processed shit you become hungry again right yeah. exactly so there's where you messed up if you really truly stick to just whole foods it really is hard for most people to over consume consistently maybe one day they ate a little bit more maybe they had a great training session the day before and so that ramped up their metabolism and their body wanted more food and so they ate a little bit extra but i'll tell you what they probably needed it on that day consistently if you eat only whole foods, it is really hard for most yeah. people to do that. And I want to add a little bit to that because uh, I've actually had uh, talked to people about this where they'll say, well, it, it is whole foods. And I'm like, it's a pie. And they're like, but I baked it myself. Like, okay, well, that, kinda, <laughs> that doesn't count either. So when we say whole foods, we're talking about foods that are not processed, but we're also referring to foods with like a few ingredients, right? Because yeah. I with could take- Nutrients in it. Yeah, because I could take whole food ingredients. I remember one time I trained a good friend of mine, Spiro. I love you, Spiro. I was training him and he just he was just a smart ass. And I remember he came in one morning and we were working on his diet. And I'm like, what'd you have for breakfast? He goes, oh, you know, Sal, Greek guy, love him. He goes, Sal, I had a, it was good breakfast. He goes, it was good. Egg, goes, I, had, I had a little bit of eggs. Yeah, I know what he did. I had a little bit of milk. I've had a client. And I'm this. listening to him like, you okay. had fucking cake, yeah. bro. I'm all eggs and milk. I'm like, he goes, you know, I had a little bit of flour. And I'm like, flour? Who the hell eats a little flour? And I'm like, wait a minute, you made cake? You had cake for breakfast? <laughs> yeah. That doesn't count. I've had a client do the same and, thing yeah. before. And he goes, what's the difference? Every ingredient is a whole one. I'm like, no, that's that's a little that's a little different. But no, it's true. If and this is where we get some of the confusion because somebody will say, but that's not true. I ate as much as I wanted, and they were all healthy foods, and I lost weight. Well, you you don't you tend to not overeat. Studies show that people who eat heavily processed foods overconsume by five hundred to six hundred calories. That's not a little bit. That's a lot. That's a big difference. Here's the other thing that you want to also consider. Remember, it's a it's a energy balance thing. So it's too many calories versus how many calories you burn. So I've also had people tell me, well, that's not true. I increased my calories, but I didn't gain any body fat. And I look at their workout program. Oh, you built muscle. Oh, your metabolism sped, sped up. So here's the bottom line. If you gain weight, it's because you ate more calories than you burned. If you lost weight, it means you ate less calories than you burned. But there's two sides of that equation. I could either burn more or I could eat more or I could burn less and I could eat less. It's the balance between the two that will determine the weight. But what, what makes up your diet has a huge impact on your overall health. And yes, you can be overweight and be healthier than somebody who's underweight, uh, even though they have less body fat than you because their diet is made up of foods that are not uh, as healthy. Look, Mind Pump is you can come check us out on YouTube as well. That's the Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Doug, the producer, at Mind Pump Doug. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. I would say the number one thing that I look for is what is their mindset? Like, are they going to put in the work? Do they realize, like, this is a testing process? Like, 
We have 15 years of experience, but do we get it right every time? No, but we will outtest everybody and we will.